A little bit of context, Luke chapter 24 follows chapter 23, which speaks to us of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 24 begins with uh, his resurrection. And we are going to read something from the account of Luke that the other gospel writers really don't uh, speak to us of. And yet there is so much here to be appreciated. So the context is the day of resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In verse 13, we're going to read of two of his disciples' followers that were returning from Jerusalem to their village called Emmaus. So Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three, four, uh, uh, three score furlongs, so maybe seven miles or so. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes being holden, that means uh, their eyes were shut in a sense, so that they should not know him or recognize him. And he said unto them, what manner of communication are these which you have one to another? Or what are you speaking to yourselves about as you walk and are sad? And the one of them whose name was Cleopas answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a mighty uh, a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God in all the people, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Notice verse 21, But we trusted, or we were hoping, or we thought that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And behold all this. Today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And we, when they found not his body, they came saying, that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us uh, went to the sepulcher, uh, speaking of Peter and John, and found it so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Verse 23, sorry, verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, the books of Moses, the beginning of the Bible, and the prophets, he expounded unto them the things in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, we'll just drop down for the sake of time. Verse 45, the Lord Jesus meets with, uh, sorry, 44, with his disciples in Jerusalem. Verse 44, he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved, for it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. 
we can appreciate very much the detail that Luke gives us in his Gospels. And as I have said, there are things, actually quite a number of things that Luke records for us that the other Gospel writers do not. One of them, as I mentioned, is this section here of these two on the road to Emmaus. Now, what is going on in their minds? The Bible tells us that their hearts are saddened. They have been disappointed in their hopes. Their hopes have been dashed. As they consider the Lord Jesus, whom, as we have just read, they considered to be the one that was going to redeem Israel or going to deliver Israel from the bondage of the Romans. Now, what I'd like just to simply consider is this. That is the long-awaited promise of the nation of Israel. Something that the Old Testament tells much about the coming of one who is going to establish again the nation of Israel, not as the tail, but as the head of the nations. If you look back at the course of the history of the nation of Israel, you can see how God dealt with that nation in a very special way, taking them out of Egypt in bondage and taking them into that promised land. Of course, the course of time, you'll read of men that were raised up by God, like David, not the first, but the second king of Israel. And you'll notice how that they could enjoy peace in that land, something that David could bring about. And then after the death of David, we have Solomon, and his son. And what was enjoyed by the nation very simply was great prosperity. The gold and the silver that flowed in Jerusalem was an awesome thing. And the nation of Israel was very, very prosperous, enjoying material blessings and the peace of David. But unfortunately, after the time of Solomon, there was, uh, in the nation of Israel, great decadence. You read that, very soon the nation would be divided. And you read that there was great conflicts. And as you go through the Old Testament, that's what you'll find is that God even has to judge his people because of their sin against him. And not only do we read that they lose the prosperity, they lose their peace. And they're actually taken out of the land that God had brought them into. And they're made slaves once again to the Assyrians and later to the Babylonians. And his history just repeats itself time and time again. In the time of the Lord Jesus, the nation finds themselves again under Gentile dominion. No king, no peace, and very little prosperity. But what so many of the Old Testament prophets that were spent to speak to them of their sins also spoke to them of the coming of the Messiah, or the New Testament word, the Christ. So that was the longing of the heart of the Israelite to know the coming of Messiah, that they might know the peace and prosperity that the nation once knew. So here comes one who is mighty in word and deed, Jesus of Nazareth. Here is one that performs things that only God could do. Nicodemus recognizes you must be the teacher sent from God. No one can do these things that you do except God be with him. But we come to the end of the Gospels and we find that the Lord Jesus is, is led out of the city of Jerusalem and he is crucified. Nailed upon a cross as if he were a criminal between two men that were. And he suffers and he dies. To the dismay, the disappointment of these people as they themselves confess the Lord Jesus in his resurrected body draws alongside as a stranger to inquire, why are you so sad in your hearts? And they begin to ask him, are you the, the, the only stranger here that does not know what happened to Jesus of Nazareth? The people had him as a prophet, mighty in word and work. Before God and the people, they said. But our rulers, our leaders, condemned him to death 
And he was crucified and he died. And listen to their words. We trusted. We were hoping. We thought. And what we find is this, that things were not as they thought they were going to be. And why is it that things were not as they thought they should be? You notice how the Lord Jesus rebukes them in verse 25. He said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. What was the problem? There was not a, a real accurate understanding of the word of God. That their thinking did not align with the scriptures. What they thought was one thing. And what was spoken of in the scriptures beginning from Moses and the, the prophets and the Psalms. There was not an agreement. And you might ask yourself this evening, what does that have to do with, with me and in Sarnia here this evening? Well, I have a question for you very simply. Are you in agreement with the Word of God? Does your thinking align with the Scriptures? I think we all understand that, that there is so much confusion in this world when it comes to God, when it comes to heaven, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to religion. We would say that there is so many people with so many ideas. But the question ought to be this. Not what do other people think, or not even what do I think, but what do the Scriptures say concerning God's salvation? When it comes to uh, what we have read here, we are going to understand that this is not something uh, uh, that we shouldn't understand, but something that we absolutely should and must understand. And the purpose of these gospel meetings is simply this to present the Word of God to you, that you might be plainly convinced in your own soul that this is true, that this is accurate. This is something that is acceptable, something that is dependable for me. But there is a great problem if your hopes are not based in the Scriptures. And sadly today, there are many people and they are very careless when it comes to the matter of their eternal well-being. Ask yourself this evening, what am I trusting in when it comes to getting to heaven? Where is my confidence when it comes to salvation and the forgiveness of sins? Some people are trusting in their working and doing that must be good enough to get me to heaven. The question is, is that what the Word of God teaches? There are others that are saying, I'm quite satisfied with my religion and my upbringing, what my parents taught me. Let me ask you very plainly, does it agree with the Scriptures, with the Word of God? There are people today, and even when it comes to God Himself, they have their own ideas as to who God is. Their own perception or invention of who God is. You know, we could just as well start there as we preach the gospel of who God Himself is. Because we in and of ourselves often have a very skewed idea as to who God is. But you know, that the desire of God has been to reveal Himself. And there are a number of ways how God has done that. But can I tell you, God has revealed himself plainly in his word. This book that we have in our hands, please do not think that this is something that the founders of the gospel hall sat down to write out. That this is just simply the dogma, the belief of the people that gather here in Sarnia. You know, if that were the case, we would really be wasting our time here. If the only thing that we had was our ideas, as wise and studied as a people of Sarnia might be, if we are basing our hopes on what men say or what men think, that is not going to do for eternity. We ought to understand something, that God is the absolute authority. 
And God has spoken so that we might know with certainty and clarity what is God's plan of salvation. Not what is my church's plan. What is my plan to get to heaven? We're not interested in what the preacher says or the pastor or the priest or even the pope. We must align our thinking with the scriptures. And the Lord Jesus, he rebukes these people that were his disciples because he says, you have the scriptures, but you are ignoring them. And we were speaking to somebody this week, and that is exactly what they told us. That he went to church, but the Bible was never read. The scriptures were never opened. It was just the philosophy, the idea of the preacher, of the man that was behind the pulpit, but the word of God was never opened. People were ignorant of the scriptures. Now these people, the Lord Jesus said, you have ignored the scriptures. You have not believed the scriptures. Listen to what he says, verse 25. Oh, fools. Not because they were, they were slow or, or had some uh, uh, disca uh, uh, that they couldn't understand. It was that they were ignoring what was spoken. You see, the book of Proverbs, you'll read of the wise and the foolish. It, it isn't speaking of people that can't understand. It's people that are rejecting the counsel that is given. That is who the Bible calls a fool. And God is so gracious in giving us his word. But if we ignore it or even reject it, then we are fools. Because God has spoken. And there is a great harmony and agreement with the things that he says. You notice, there's no disagreement with what Moses wrote, or the prophets wrote, or the psalmist wrote. There was actually a great harmony with what they said. And yet these people had not received it or understood it. So their hopes were dashed, because their hopes were not based on the Scriptures. That is why we open the word of God when we seek to present the gospel. And thank God we have the Bible in our language. You can buy a Bible at Walmart. It isn't something that is so scarce and difficult to obtain. You can have it in your hand, in your phone, your computer. The word of God that has been given, but the question is this. Have I allowed the word of God to adjust my thinking? Have I been guided and convicted of my beliefs based on the scriptures, on the word of God? We have already heard that these meetings, when it comes to salvation, it's not about feelings. It's about the word of God and what God says in me, believing what God says. The Lord Jesus rebukes them because of their slowness to appreciate and understand the word of God. But there is a great harmony when it comes to this. And even though the, the scripture speaks so plainly of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, they failed to understand. They could appreciate very much the promise of one that was going to come to reign. But they failed to understand that before he ever reigns, he was going to suffer for sins. Now that is a truth that we can appreciate very plainly as we come to the New Testament. Maybe we shouldn't be too hard on them because as the Lord Jesus is born, it's the Gospel of Matthew that tells us that he will save his people from their sins. We come to the Gospels and it's very plain that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Not simply saving from the bondage of Gentiles, but saving from the bondage of sin. Saving from the consequence of sin. And what we can appreciate is this, the Lord Jesus says, this is what the scriptures say. This is what the scriptures say. Moses, the prophets, the psalmists. We come down then to verse 45. It says, oh, verse 44 again. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. 
that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You see, that is really our purpose. And maybe we're very feeble. And maybe we do fail to make it plain. But our purpose is that to open the scriptures with you, that you might be convinced by the scriptures. That you might see for yourself, this is God speaking to me. And to put your confidence in what this book says regarding God and His holiness, regarding you and your sinfulness, and regarding Christ and what He accomplished on the cross to save your soul. He opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. What is the message of the Scriptures? Yes, the Word of God tells us that Christ will reign absolutely. There is a day that is coming. But the Scriptures also speak to us of the necessity of His suffering. And when it comes to the preaching of the Gospel, this is going to be the message. It is Christ and the necessity of His suffering. His bearing our sin in His body on the cross. The Bible says it behooved Christ. Yes, the one who was promised, prophesied to come. It was necessary for Him to suffer. It's actually the very same one when we come to the Word of God. The one who is going to reign is the one who came to suffer first. And it was absolutely necessary according to God's plan. I would just say this. This is something that I appreciate. Again, going to this point that there are so many religions and ideas in this world. Do you know that the plan of salvation, according to the Word of God, has always been the exact same? That when it comes to the sufferings of God's Son, it's not plan B or C or Z, Z. Do you know that from the, even before the foundation of the world, it was already determined by God that His Son would come into this world to suffer? Do you understand? God only has one plan. It has never changed from beginning to end. One way of salvation through the suffering of His Son. The one who stepped from eternity into the scene. The awesome miracle of incarnation taking upon Himself a body it was not simply to live and to move and teach and to do good in healing. He took upon Himself a body. Hebrews tells us that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. That He might suffer. Do you understand that this was God's plan? That the Lord Jesus Christ is that Lamb that was truly foreordained even before the foundation of the world that He would come into this world to suffer and to shed His life's blood. That was God's plan. That is God's plan. How do we know that? It's based on the Word of God, the Scriptures. What you have in your hand this evening, what we are trying to open to you, it was necessary for Christ to suffer. But not only did He suffer, the Word of God makes it plain that God would raise Him from the dead. As we have tried to convey, we are speaking to you of a living Savior. We're speaking of one that entered willingly into death and by the power of God was raised from among the dead ones. And he proved it even here as we see, resurrected from the dead, speaking to man. In a few short days, he was going to be received up again into heaven. But listen to what the Lord Jesus tells him. All of this was necessary. Now verse 47 that repentance and the forgiveness or remission of sins should be preached in His name. This is now the message of the gospel that we preach. Not as Moses and the prophets and the psalmist looking forward to the coming of the one that would suffer. 
Now we can say he has come. He suffered. He died. He was raised. He fulfilled what the word of God promised. And because of that, we can now look backwards and say, because of what he has done, you as a poor, guilty sinner can turn from your sin and find forgiveness. This is what God is offering you. You might say, what does this have to do with us? Notice this is a message for all. That repentance and forgiveness of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. God's plan for all nations. Despite the fact that there are so many ideas and religions in this world. The only way that any of us will ever be saved is by trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior. The repentance and forgiveness of sins that is preached, it's in his name. Peter himself said, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name. There is no other person that can save us. This is God's Savior. The question for you this evening as I have to sit down is this. Does your thinking, your hope, agree with the word of God? Can you say this evening, yes, I am saved, I am forgiven, and I know it because the word of God tells me. Not because I feel it, not because I hope so. But because the word of God says that repentance and forgiveness of sins is preached in his name. And I have come to trust him. I believe the word of God. That is where my hope and confidence is found. These people were sad because they said we hoped. We trust. But not because they were trusting in the scriptures. For you. To come to trust the scriptures, to take it as true, as real, is the only thing that is going to give you peace. You understand that the scriptures do not change? Our experiences, they might fade in our memories. Our emotions come and go, but the word of God does not change. We can always come back to the word of God, and it tells us exactly the same. That the forgiveness of sins is found in Jesus Christ. If you do not know him, trust him tonight. Look at the scriptures for yourself. And understand, this is a faithful saint. This is worthy of your acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to save a sinner like me.